Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 55, Cletus Cassidy. Well, at some point we were going to get to him. Yeah, he's a big enough name and certainly has enough issues. I hate to use that term because I it's really not an intended pun, but I don't know what else to use with it. He's got enough things about his character and his persona that certainly warrants an episode. And since he is the crux of the absolute carnage event being written by uh, Donny Cates, that is uh, the major one of the major focuses and storylines going on in Marvel Comics right now. And Doc, you just had the column, the guest column that you did for Adventures in Poor Taste. That's right. I forgot about that. So that was uh, about two weeks ago. We we did that. It, it should have been a little closer, but again, we, we missed a week. Whoopsie. It happens. And before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Cage's Kiss Podcast. Every episode covers one of the entries in the filmography of the national treasure that is Nicolas Cage. And yes, that pun was absolutely intended. But, you know, the thing about Nick Cage is his movies are just so intense, man. Yeah, okay. I, I apologize. It's not that I'm not a Nicolas Cage fan. It's just he's an acquired taste. I would not disagree with that. And I will also say that Nicolas Cage is one of those characters, one of those people rather, well, characters. <laughs> Nicolas Cage really is a character unto himself. I think at this point he can he can almost be considered a, a human cartoon, but he's one of those actors that when he's on, he's amazing, but he he just works. To his credit, he's willing to, to show up in just about anything as long as there's a paycheck involved. But it's not always good, and you don't always get the good Nicolas Cage. So our friends over at Cage's Kiss break down each of his films, and uh, it's it's very, very entertaining. So you can check them out. You can find them basically wherever you find podcasts. So let's start with Cletus Cassidy, Carnage. He was created by David Michelini. Michelini? I think that's how you pronounce it. I apologize. We'll shout him out and tag him and uh, social media, uh, and Eric Larson, I know how to pronounce that, in The Amazing Spider-Man number 344, March of 1991. He was created, side note, because Michelin wanted to kill off Eddie Brock in ASM 400, but Venom was way too popular of a character, plus it, it I guess it ended up working out because Michelin wasn't writing ASM 400 by the time that issue rolled around. J.M.D. Mateus was, who I had the opportunity to speak with um, on Into the Night. So instead of killing off Eddie Brock in number 400, they killed off Aunt May instead. Cletus Cassidy was born in Ravencroft, Ravencroft Asylum, but his heart stopped for a few minutes after he was born until he was revived by an ancient evil who foresaw that Cletus would be the one to free him from his prison. Yeah. And this is something that we just find out as part of the buildup uh, to the absolute carnage event that this was all part of Cletus's backstory that he literally was, he died minutes after he was born but was resurrected because you will be the one to to save me from the Clintar, which we've spoken about on the Eddie Brock episode. The Clintar is the race of symbiotes that uh, take over the bodies of Eddie Brock and Cletus Cassidy. And Yeah, the one real part that I'll shout out to this is that he had the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. That's what happened. It's unfortunate. It's a random event. It can lead to a person dying even in utero. So the fact that he survived it is a good thing. The fact that he didn't have quote unquote lasting brain damage is a good thing. The fact that he was born in Ravencroft, that's a completely different story. Yeah. So as a child, he pushed his grandmother down a flight of stairs and killed her. He threw a hairdryer in the bathtub with his mother, which didn't kill her, but he did torture and kill his mother's dog with a drill. That to me is the worst of of his offenses. Not, not that I'm pro pushing Nana downstairs or trying to make an electric bubble bath for your mom, but the dog, that's, that's a bridge too far. 
Because okay. a person can defend themselves. A, a dog is just, man, don't, don't hurt animals. You know, there's an interesting cultural point to this that I think people are going to rage about depending on what side they come on with this. Pets aren't people. And so, yes, I think it's absolutely horrible, but I'm sorry. I'm not going to say that I value a dog more than I value a human being, especially when it was his own kin. So I'll admit, I can't totally agree with you on that. I think all of them are horrible atrocities. I'll still rank, especially pushing grandmother down the stairs. Uh, that That's, wow. You, you basically have to blindside someone or... Heaven forbid he did it in front. I, I don't care. It's just all terrible. My goodness. But I agree with you that pets aren't people. They're better than people. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, Dogs are better than people. Oh, boy. And I, some cats. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but we're, we need to keep this under you know, two hours. So I'm not going to get into a huge sidetrack on this, but I think there are some people in our audience that may know what I'm hinting at when I say I can't even come close to agreeing with that. Okay, moving forward. Anyway, so his father went to jail for beating his mother. So he was raised in an orphanage, which he burned down after killing the administrator. So this kid is basically bad seed on steroids. So he grew up to become a serial killer. No surprise, because one of the leading indicators of potential future violence as an adult is violence against animals as chi as a child. Not and to mention the pyromania that he exhibited, you know, problems with fire, problems with dogs. This is going to sound really weird, but I wonder if he wet the bed as a kid as well, okay? I'm not going to get into why I would ask that, but so be it. There's so many random criminology indicators that have come up over the years. Some of them have been completely debunked, but the point stands that this type of situation is studied immensely for decades. And at this point, if you don't know the indicators, you don't have to. Someone doing bad things before and then doing bad things later is simple enough. So he grew up to become a serial killer. He shared a cell at Rikers with Eddie Brock, and if you want to find out more about Eddie Brock, you can listen to our very first episode. Don't. Or I was just about to say, or don't, because our show has evolved so much since then. I really think we should do a revisit on Eddie Brock and do it the way that we do shows now, not the way we did them then. But I digress. So when the Venom symbiote rebonded with Eddie Brock, a piece of it broke off and merged with Cletus Cassidy, creating Carnage, who is just much more of a volatile looking symbiote just from an artistic standpoint, the way that he's drawn. I think Carnage is just really cool looking compared to Venom, but I digress. So Spider-Man and Venom had to team up to defeat him, and the symbiote was thought to be destroyed, but it ended up being bonded to his blood. It wasn't fully gone. So then in the Maximum Carnage storyline, which anybody from our generation would remember as the red Super Nintendo video game, Maximum Carnage, he broke out of the vault and joined other villains to take over New York City until he was defeated by a collection of heroes. Then he was being held in the raft. He escaped, but our good friend, the Sentry, good old Bob, uh, flew him out, to the, out of the atmosphere and then ripped him in half. And that was the end of that. Well, I'm glad that concludes everything in a neat little package. <laughs> if only. So, with that, long story short, Carnage is one of those characters that he goes out, he kills lots of people, he gets captured, they think the Venom symbiote, they think the symbiote is gone, he gets it back, he breaks out, he kills more people, rinse and repeat. During the Axis storyline where the morality of heroes and villains gets inverted, which was great in concept, not so great in execution, but his morality becomes inverted. He becomes a hero and he sacrifices himself to save humanity from the bomb that was set by the evil X-Men. All right. Again, it's not a bad storyline. It just, I think, I they didn't quite stick some of the, the plot points, but like I said, I like the idea of it conceptually. Yeah. Sure. So, we, as I said, right now we are we are covering Cletus because of the absolute carnage storyline. So, long story short, and because it's still very early on in the storyline, we don't know where it's going to end up. But the symbiote has returned and bonds with the aforementioned ancient evil that we've discussed uh, by the name of Null, and 
So now Cletus, Null, and the symbiote have created this giant, basically 13 foot tall, mega badass carnage, and they are wreaking havoc. They killed an entire town in Colorado. Something that large, do you think they're compensating for something? I don't know. So let's get into the issues. <laughs> because again, I don't want to belabor too much of the backstory, but Cletus Cassidy is a a really he's a fucked up serial killer. That's that's his if you really want to break it down, I mean he's he's was created to basically have no moral center whatsoever. The the writer said he wanted to create a character that was so far gone morally that there was no way that you could possibly empathize with him or anything that he did. So the first thing, and I'm going to sort of tie into some of the stuff that you had written in your column, he displays conduct disorder as a child. And I think it's a situation where intervention by you or a mental health professional could have potentially prevented further problems as an adult. Maybe his grandmother would still be alive. Maybe the dog would still be alive. Any one of those things, if he had been properly intervened and treated as a child, could have prevented the mass murders that we see as an adult. But why don't you just explain a little bit about what conduct disorder is and then sort of some of the the things that he's exhibited and how we can, how they could be addressed. Cool. Because I get to do something that I haven't done in a little bit of a while. <laughs> Pardon me. Just got to get something out here. I think you know what I'm going to get out. You may Excuse not. Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm talking about the DSM, in case you were wondering. All right, people, just so that I don't get in trouble, I'm telling you I'm reading this from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, version 5. Conduct disorder, repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated as manifested by the presence of at least three of the following 15 criteria in the past 12 months from any of the categories below. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to give some real obvious examples often initiates physical fights, has used a weapon that can cause serious physical harm to others, has been physically cruel to people, has been physically cruel to animals, has stolen while confronting a victim, has forced someone into sexual activity, has broken into someone's house building or car, often lies to obtain goods or favors, often stays out at night despite parental prohibitions. Yeah, that's the least of... <laughs> yeah, if you're, break, if you're breaking curfew, I don't think that qualifies you for conduct disorder. Yeah. That is Otherwise, the, yeah. a good majority of our listeners, <laughs> some of my family members, would be <laughs> would require some mental health intervention. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. The disturbance of behavior causes clinically significant impairment in social, academic, or occupational functioning. And if the individual is 18 years or older, criteria are not meant for antisocial personality disorder. If you want to know more about that, there, there are other episodes where I've, I've gone through that. So it classifies it from childhood, meaning under teenage years, adolescent, which we generally think of as teenage years, and unspecified. And then there's another way to categorize it with pro-social or antisocial emotions. And what that means is if for whatever reason this person does it and people say, golly gee, for some reason, they still seem like someone I can relate to or my God, get the heck away from me. So ironically, you can take that one of two ways because some people I think would be more scared of the former instead of the latter. Honestly, I think Cletus is in the latter because with a few exceptions, for the most part, what I think it comes down to is that even with this type of diagnosis, people can still make connections with other people. It's just they're going to be really screwed up connections. So I'm pretty sure we've established that Cletus met all of this criteria. The good news is many of these symptoms or behaviors are easy to spot. No one really wonders whether or not you should intervene when someone is assaulting an animal. We may wonder if we need to intervene when a teenager is crying because we don't know if it's just in the moment and something emotional happened and that's a typical response or if it's a true source of severe depression and potential su suicidality or what have you. So in a way, that makes it simpler for someone like Cletus to get an intervention. The problem is, and I'm not saying this to disparage my field, it's human nature where we 
often don't want to deal with these types of cases. They are incredibly intense. And you are in certain ways putting yourself in a situation where if things don't go right, you become part of the problem. What do I mean by that? It basically means that people are looking for you to be the savior. Really in that comic book sense, you're the one that's going to get everything done and this person's going to be all better. And any result beyond that is considered a failure, in which case it harms you in terms of your reputation and it may harm you in the eyes of the person that you are trying to help because they may develop the idea that they're beyond help. That's never an indication you want to give. So often it's not just the symptoms themselves that become a problem. It becomes the recidivism of trying to make an intervention, the intervention for whatever reason, not getting the result that we would want and lather, rinse, repeat, often with multiple people. So it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy that nothing is ever going to get better and this child is doomed. That's not something that anyone would advocate. It's a fear that certain clinicians have. And I've talked to people about it. It's not something that I'm just giving conjecture about. I've actually seen that. Having said that, there's another negative that often comes about with this, and that is who's to quote unquote blame in the first place. Unfortunately, who's going to be the ultimate scapegoats for this? Because it's a minor. It's a person that is not considered quote unquote capable of making the rational decisions that an adult is expected to make. So it's going to come back to the parents. I am not aware of any situation other than Frank outright vicious, horrible, consistent abuse where I would say the parents are 100% responsible. So I would say the percentage gets magnified more than it needs to. I will say that, of course, no one's perfect and parents can do things that may not have positive outcomes. But even in the most loving, concerning, and caring family, if these types of behaviors are exhibited, there's plenty of opportunities for intervention on the parental side. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're making it better or worse because this still is an individual. So sometimes I feel like we, we dramatize it to the point that if only someone had done this or that or, or whatever. I agree that it should be tried and I agree that it should be tried no matter what nonstop to save this person. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be so idealistic and so blinded that everything's going to work out perfectly. And this person, this child is always going to end up in the good graces of the rest of society for the rest of their lives. I'd much rather say we're going to be on a really bumpy roller coaster with a kid like this. And we're going to make sure that we find ways to smooth it out. And we'll make sure that people hopefully don't get hurt along the way. We're going to put guardrails. We're going to put safety harnesses. We're going to endure this together. You hope that you can develop the type of longstanding relationships with other mental health professionals that understand they're going to be helping them through this ride and that it doesn't have to involve what often gets involved, and that's the legal system, because the legal ramifications with regards to how children are handled are way different than how the rest of mental health views things. It's hard to say it, but it almost becomes immediately punitive. And once we're On that side of things, it's much difficult, much more difficult to dig out of that hole. Agreed. And I do think that there there needs to be a societal change in the way that we view folks that are undergoing treatment, whether it's for something drastic, whether it's for something not so drastic, whether it's just, you know, someone who's just going to therapy because they feel that they need a little bit of guidance in their life, or whether it's for an individual like a young Kalidas Cassidy who desperately needs major intervention to rewrite him, uh, to or not to rewrite him, but to get him back on the, the right track. But I think that is a societal thing, and that sort of ties in with what we were talking about last week when we were discussing making those connections with other people, making sure that we see the other person and that you acknowledge them that they're struggling. And that that expression that goes around all the time, everybody is going, everybody has a struggle that you know nothing about. And if, as long as we acknowledge that, I'm not saying you have to automatically concede to anything any everyone does and say, oh, well, it's not their fault and they're going through stuff and therefore I'm going to 
you know, look past it. Obviously, people still ultimately need to be responsible for their actions. But if you acknowledge where they're coming from, then I think it does a greater service to the community and to society and to ultimately mankind to have those thoughts and say, I'm not going to jump to the worst case scenario and say, oh, well, your parents are your parents are terrible. Therefore, you're screwed up and you're going to be screwed up, whatever that you acknowledge that there are going to be, as you said, bumps in the road, that there's going to be a learning process and that we're not automatically going to jump down their throat if they make a mistake. And we need to be much more generally forgiving as a society. Last week, we had the challenge, you know, acknowledge, ask somebody how they're doing, forgive this week. Don't immediately jump to the worst case scenario. If someone wrongs you, obviously this is case dependent. I'm not saying necessarily every situation is going to be, okay, I forgive you. But if we take that moment to say, maybe there's another reason and then it's not just, well, they're out to get me or they're trying to screw me over or they want to hurt me. Maybe they're, maybe they're hurting. Maybe the person is going through some stuff and they lashed out. You know, we get we get upset at toddlers for throwing tantrums. And this is something that I'm I'm reading a lot about and learning as the father of a five month old child. We get upset with children who throw tantrums and, you know, at cry and kick their feet and scream and whatever. We have to acknowledge that they can't emotionally regulate the way that adults can because adults throw tantrums. We may not lay down on the floor in the aisle of a supermarket and kick and scream, but we get pissed off. We yell, we we lose control. Why are we all of a sudden saying to a child, to a five-year-old or a three-year-old, you have to you have to keep it together? I know adults in their 40s that can't keep it together. Why are mm. we enforcing this on a child? So for someone like Cletus to bring it back, when he's going through all these things, when he's not not the violent stuff, obviously, but if he's doing these temper tantrums and he's lashing out, this is because emotionally he's overwhelmed. He can't process it because he doesn't have a positive outlet. He needs somebody to help show him this is, I, I acknowledge you. I understand, you know, it's, it's respectful parenting. I acknowledge you're going through stuff. Let's see if we can talk about it in a, in a more constructive fashion. And I think if someone had done that with Cletus from a younger age, it would have turned out a lot better for him. But unfortunately he didn't have the role models as parents to be able to show him that because kids ultimately do, kids ultimately learn by seeing. Whatever it is that we do as parents is going to be a large uh, indicator of what they're going to do as children. We can tell them all the time, this is what you should do, but ultimately they're gonna do what they see. And so if we model that positive behavior, it's gonna have a lot better outcome for the children. Right. So. So my challenge to our listeners this week is forgive and at least acknowledge that someone may be going through some stuff that you know nothing about, and that's why they're lashing out. That's fantastic. I greatly appreciate that. And just to clarify a point that I brought up during this discussion, I am in no way absolving Cletus of anything that he has done, both as a child and as an adult. Nor am I. I just want to clarify that. That's right. This is a matter of if there are consequences to actions and it includes certain societal expectations, then fine. Work within that construct. That doesn't mean you take away those consequences at any point. Just that if you can do everything in your power so that certain events don't happen that require those constraints. That's what we're trying to say. Like, let's get to this before someone gets hurt or dies. Exactly. So Proactive, not reactive. Right. Because I've actually had the direct experience of seeing people in jail, in prison. And it's not a fun circumstance because often that person is now processing all of the things that have happened in their life, mainly because they have the time to do it. There's not much else that they can do in that circumstance. So it's interesting the amount of reflection and retrospection that people are doing in those situations. And it's their own kind of therapy, sometimes for the better, sometimes not. But it's almost a forced situation regardless of if the mental health system is involved or not. So with someone like Cletus, at that time when he's an adult and he's in with someone like Eddie Brock or whoever, that is basically trying to 
glue leaves on a dead tree, honestly. It, you're, you're really, really way gone to try and, and, and fix whatever it is that you think needs to be fixed at that point. So that's why the focus has been so much on his youth as opposed to all the things as an adult. You still can look to help an adult. But once a conduct disorder ends up meeting the criteria for antisocial personality, you're really behind the eight ball. And it's not just an uphill climb. It's saying that you have to levitate almost. I apologize. I don't mean to sound pessimistic because once again, I have seen people improve. But I'm saying it's it's a huge magnitude and difference, in my opinion. I don't think it's being pessimistic. I think it's being realistic based on your observations as an expert in the field to be able to say, I have seen this and these instances where someone has the type of recovery or rehabilitation that we would like are few and far between. So I, I'm not saying, and, and nor are you, you're not saying it's impossible. You're just saying it's it's not very likely. So moving on to the, the next issue, because really, Cletus, I mean, we we normally do three, but Doc and I were talking before the show that Cletus is, I don't want to say clear cut, but because of the nature of the character, it really boils down to the conduct disorder as a child. And as an adult, he has this nihilistic mindset and he believes that laws are words and meaningless and the only true freedom is chaos. And that chaos comes from bloodshed and murdering. That is a very difficult mindset, I think, for a lot of people to parse through and to be able to comprehend exactly what that means and what impact that can have on someone moving forward. So, Doc, I don't know what you want to do to to try and chop that down into bite-sized morsels, but... Okay, from a professional standpoint, I'll say that someone with this mindset is not even going to acknowledge the necessity of intervention because, by definition, if you are having a dialogue with another human being and the goal of that is for that person to follow a specific path, you've already violated their major tenet. So there you go. We've already broken everything. What really concerns me, though, is not automatically the chaos part. I think there are many people, especially, we we were mentioning children, but adolescents as well, recognize that they don't want the status quo. They do want things to be different in the world. And recognizing that they may not have to do things exactly the way previous generations did, specifically their parents, if that's the biggest influence, or whatever adult figure serves as a a parent, that opens up a lot of other opportunities to them. It can be a good thing. The idea, though, that absolutely everything, every base factor is wrong. And therefore, you almost feel like the world needs to be reset. The idea that you, this is this is grandiosity I, I can't even imagine, you are the person that is responsible for instituting that level of change. For most people, that would be considered burdensome. At least anyone that thinks Even if I create that change, that means I have to instill my own order. Cletus doesn't get that. Cletus is purely about, I'm doing it because I think I can. And based on his reactions to things, if he kills someone, it's because that's what was supposed to happen because he did it. Any attempt to put other actions or reason to it don't resonate because he threw them out a long time ago. So this terrifies me. I don't know how to reason with someone that can't even get the most basic order of how humanity has survived this long. If you want to say that freedom, quote unquote, freedom is about chaos, is about bloodshed or or, or things like that, then I would challenge that that person honestly doesn't care about other people because 
How can you make a connection with someone? A connection by definition means that you are willing to forego other potential actions for the sake of including another person. In other words, I'm talking to Anthony right now and I'm talking to the listeners of this podcast. By definition, I'm not talking to other people about other topics. I could just as easily be talking about the start of the football season with other people I really don't know and they don't know anything about me, but I'd much rather be doing this because I have a vested interest. So imagine if nobody had that. You can't do anything that requires organization. I, I, I just, it, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. But when the only rebuttal that you have if your Cletus Cassidy is simply, I'm going to destroy you, then do you really need any other skills? It's that old saying, if you're a carpenter with a hammer, everything is a nail. So he doesn't really have to develop anything besides a simplistic view, because if someone challenges him, let's say someone really is fighting him, are they fighting him because they have a valid point? No, they're fighting him because it's an opportunity for him to go ahead and fight him back. He doesn't even have to Worry about what the reason is. There's no reason to even talk about it. You want to fight? Be cool. I got an opportunity to kill. It's just like giving him a feedlot. That's 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 horrific. I really don't like thinking this way. Because because this is not how humanity is designed. Humanity is designed where there can be a lot of conflicts, a lot of fighting. But for the most part, it's because we have different structures and my structure is best. In Cletus's situation, his point is, no, 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 no. There is no structure. It's just I'm the best. <laughs> yeah. It's um it's very similar to what the Joker was talking about in The Dark Knight when he was talking to Harvey Dent in the hospital. That that scene, I think, which is very mm. well done. But the whole thing of at least know. at least though with that scene, most people that I talked to recognized even as the Joker was describing it. And saying, you know, that man's a schemer. I'm not a schemer. Like everybody, at least that I was with, basically said, well, uh, this is the most elaborate scheme I've seen in a Batman movie ever. So I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but OK, go with that. Yeah, but that's <laughs> but that's my point is Joker convincing Harvey Dent yeah. to face that everything is chaos and that that's yeah. freedom and so on and so forth. And the number of people that I think idolize mm. or lionize that scene. Mm concerns me. I see Mm. that a lot on social media, folks pointing that out that, oh, the Joker had it right. And so, no, 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 he did not. (laughs) No. If you ever find yourself saying the Joker had it right, you really need to question (laughs) yourself. But to that end, I do think that it is a gross misstatement or extrapolation of how we view conflict in society, as you were saying, that if I have one mindset and you have another, we can we can have a conflict. We may have a conflict and we may be able to resolve that through words, actions, what have you. But there is still ultimately that basis that I want things a certain way. You want things another way. And the structures and the way things are set up, stop those from from happening with each other. Whereas Cletus's mindset is, let's just get rid of everything and see what happens. And that's that's anarchy in its purest sense. And that can't last because it will cannibalize itself and then everything is is destroyed and nothing works. And we as individuals, both as individuals and as society writ large, we cannot abide with anarchy for too long. We need structure. I think it's something that's just hardwired in our brains. We see that even in animals, even in, in Basically, most living things have some sort of structure set up with society that there's an alpha or there's a couple of alphas or there's some sort of system set up in place for cooperation or interaction amongst individuals that everybody gets something out of some, you know, everybody gets something out of it. But we all understand that there's this setup. You can't just wipe it all clean and go, well, let's see what happens. I just realized because we said we don't have a third topic. I don't know if you want to call this a separate topic, but given that we're talking about Carnage and we're talking about Cletus Cassidy, we haven't actually delved into the symbiote itself because there have been times where it's been separated from Cletus and involved in other characters, but seems to keep that anarchist kind of bent, whatever you want to call it. 
it's been made very clear that the bond between Cletus and this symbiote is so strong that it refers to it as I instead of we, the way Eddie Brock and Venom do. I think the reason for that and the references to how it came through his blood, I think that's powerful because the whole point of this, and I did mention this in the Eddie Brock episode, was a symbiote is an organism that basically relies on another organism for certain biological reasons, and both organisms have a benefit. The idea that the symbiote, whether it's foreign or alien or whatever, is so well bonded to this serial killer and has no other avenues that it needs to explore. It doesn't have to explain itself. Cletus doesn't have to adjust. That tells me that Cletus may have had all of those things we just mentioned, that organization, that interaction, all of that fully satisfied with the symbiote alone and therefore doesn't need anybody else. And if that's the case, ooh, yeah, yeah. It may not be that he's different from every other human that ever existed and really doesn't need anybody. It's that he already has it. And because he has it so quote unquote perfectly, he doesn't have to put any energy other than how he wants to just raise. And by raise, I mean R-A-Z-E. He wants to just destroy everything else because he's already got it all figured out. It's all done with what he needs biologically, psychologically, all of it. So the world, the universe at large is useless. Wow. I had never considered that until just this moment, but it makes perfect sense that he he has everything he needs from the symbiote and the symbiote gets everything it needs from Cletus. Yeah. Because the symbiote did at various points when it left Cletus, it bonded with, I think, John Jameson at mm -hmm. one point. John Jameson, I yeah. think it bonded with Ben Riley yeah. for a spell. It, it has bonded with others, but it always comes back to Cletus, much yeah. more so than at least the Venom symbiote. It was with Matt Gargan for a while. It was with Flash Thompson for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it started off with Spider-Man and so on, but Carnage always comes back. And we're not even getting into all of the offshoots and all the other offspring, you know, yeah. Shriek and, and toxin. All, toxin and all of the other Venom slash Carnage children that exist. Although I do think that would make for a fascinating episode. We could probably do them maybe collectively. But wow, that Cletus is, is fulfilled in a sense. It's it. His needs are very harsh and we may find them antithetical to society as a whole. And they're certainly not beneficial to anyone else, but it's good for Cletus. Yeah. Oof, that is uh, that is interesting. We may have to expound. You may need to do a whole write up oh, on that. <laughs> you, I think you just backed yourself into a corner that you're going to have to do a write up on that for the website because uh, we do appreciate you getting back into the writing swing of things with the Jason Todd bit from uh, from last week. Um, so we're going to take a short break and then when we come back. We're going to get into treatment. Hello, this is the voice of Noel from the musical group Deleter. Check out our extended play record, The Other Void, based on the Marvel character Moon Knight. It's available September 13th, or you can check out our single now, Box, streaming at deleter.bandcamp.com. Do you love movies and psychology? Do you want to know what it would be like if Batman was in your therapy office? Listen to our podcast, Popcorn Psychology. Three therapists dissect blockbuster movies, available everywhere you find podcasts. Have you ever been reading through a stack of comics and thought, maybe I should see what the Sarkham Asylum game is all about? Or been playing Marvel vs. Capcom and felt like you were at a real disadvantage since you didn't know who half the characters were? Well, Play Comics is the show for you. I'm Chris, and each episode we take a look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. 
So whether you know the comics and want to know how all these games work, or you know the games and want to find out where all this craziness came from, go check out Play Comics at playcomics.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And we're back. So getting into treatment, starting off with in-universe. Um, get the symbiote out. Just it, get it out. I don't care how. I don't it's, care it's when. It's been tried, get out. though. That's get the out. thing. Get out. Man, oh, man. I don't I don't care what means are, are necessary to do that. Because here's the thing. If they've tried to get the symbiote out, it's bonded to his blood. They've killed Kalidas Cassidy, and the symbiote has brought him back to life. <sighs> At this point, they are so codependent upon each other for survival, you cannot extricate the symbiote from his blood because uh, it will, it is bonded to him, and it will keep him alive. He uh, was, it was removed, and it, and uh, somebody lobotomized Cletus Cassidy mm. for a spell, and the symbiote kept him alive in a stasis mm. Mm. in in his body. Okay. So I don't. So just speaking okay. from an in-universe standpoint, fine. fine. I I'm just I, I agree with you that ultimately the symbiote needs to be. Uh, extricated but i don't know how right right so if you can think oh if man. you can concoct a way to make that happen then kudos to you but i don't know how you do it okay so so let's thinking let's, thinking outside the box in universe what you need is you need to take this man that is known for killing people and wanting chaos and bonded with a biological entity that allows for superhuman abilities to be manifest upon all of society, and you need to get this thing to chill out. Fine. How do I trick this thing? And what I mean by that is, how do I get this person, this Cletus symbiote combination, how do I get it to think that it's still accomplishing its main goal without other people getting hurt. This is going to sound strange, but similarly to when people are in horrible circumstances in real life and everyone around them is getting hurt, let's say they are in a criminal setting. Uh, I apologize, in a in a civil setting for criminals. I'm, I'm doing my best not to just automatically say jail because there's other circumstances, but... Sometimes it's a matter of solitary. Sometimes it's a matter of just having the person being watched. But if there was such a thing in universe and, and creating almost like a pocket dimension, just something where Cletus is running wild and feels like everything he's doing is being absolutely fulfilled, but no harm is coming to anyone. Almost like a, a, a psychological stasis just something to temporarily give people like me and people way smarter than me the opportunity to come up with some other idea to get the symbiote away. Just even if it's a matter of buying time for, for a short while, I think that would be the best first step. Do not let this person have the opportunity to continue to do damage to others. And no, I am not advocating what the sentry did. And no, I'm not advocating for him to be killed. I, I simply can't out of ethical considerations. But having him isolated in some way, having him in some other condition that allows for some level of rest, because be it conduct disorder or antisocial personality disorder, these are high energy, high effort disorders. What I mean is the person has to be active with these ideas for long periods of time. And similar to other conditions, they don't get an opportunity for it to ever rest. And even if you put a person that is not truly addressing the underlying problems in a quote-unquote stable situation, they may very well sabotage it, whether they quote-unquote mean to or not. So... I can't even take that chance. Maybe the best answer I could come up with is that, oh boy, this is going to sound really weird. Once again, Doc's gone off the deep end. We briefly mentioned the symbiote family. Is there a way we can create that true nuclear family? Are you suggesting 
a group session with the rest of the symbiote children? I need some level of basis that Cletus is going to understand that there is a structure and hierarchy that can still produce something that he would be consider that he would consider worthy of value. Well, see, I, the, the 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 only concern I have with that is that canonically the symbiotes don't really acknowledge their offspring as children. Oh, they don't. They can't stand each other at times. That's that's so been, that's, that's been shown multiple times. But my point is, if we're looking to actually do something different, then maybe that is the opportunity. Because if the symbiotes can recognize that there's some sort of positive outcome if they are, ironically, synergistic, then maybe that would allow their other co-hosts to come to a similar conclusion. This is dangerous. And I'm not even sure I'm advocating it. I am really speculating here because similarly to these types of conditions and these types of behaviors in the real world, my fuse is very short when it comes to this. And I have to do my best to mitigate my thoughts, which is why I made it clear I'm not advocating something about like what the century did. But then again, sometimes I wonder, man, maybe I should just have the century there. <laughs> okay, I'm being honest. I'm being honest because that's how brutal these types of cases can be. And it may come to the idea that maybe I'm not the person to do it if I can't clear my mind well enough. Just saying. That's perfectly fair. Um, and it's it takes a strong individual to admit that they, that something is beyond their purview or that, uh, that something requires intervention or ability that, that they cannot provide. So I think it's it's big of you to say that this may be beyond what you can handle or what you could possibly do. Now, out of universe, um, serial killer with a horrible background. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, take away the strip away the symbiote. And he's a classic case study of a serial killer with a horrible childhood. Well, to be honest with you, take away the symbiote piece and you have a very similar problem. I, I'm not sure. It's very difficult to say to a person that everything that they've done up to that point, almost everything, has led to a negative outcome without sounding like you're directly blaming them from the day they were born. That's not the goal. The goal is, first of all, to establish some sort of positive value that they want for themselves or for something that they care about. Thankfully, it's not usually as bad as a character like Cletus makes it sound. It's not usually a total chaos type of situation. I mean, Manson had the, the family as, as just a random example. So... Thankfully, whether it's a serial killer or not, people still make other connections with other people. And those are still things that you can point out that, well, what's the what's the trait that they liked about you? And it's usually not the killing. So you can work with that. Everyone has their own unique foibles or quirks or, or things that are usually not threatening in any way. And trying to expound upon that can be a great way to develop some baseline level of rapport. Beyond that, this really does become much more of a basic behavioral tenet, similar to how you would use a token economy with children. You do something that most people would deem to be a positive action and you receive a reward. After a certain number of rewards, you correction, after a certain number of tokens, then you'll be able to have extra time for yourself. If you're in the, if you're in a prison and, you know, you'll be able to go out in the courtyard for 15 minutes instead of 10. 
you may have to deal with this similar to what I mentioned with Carnage. Instead of saying I need a pocket dimension, sometimes just the isolation and being in solitary, if we're talking about prison system, it may be necessary. I don't think for prolonged periods of time that's a good idea. As a matter of fact, it's inhumane. But for short periods of time, it can be a great benefit. So that's another consideration. Medication in terms of a person outwardly exhibiting agitation to the point that they are a danger to themselves or others. We follow the typical benzodiazepine slash antipsychotic slash sedative. I I hate to say these things because this is not how I typically think of it, but this is a matter of people surviving. And so the threshold is really low for interventions. And of course, there's the one part that nobody ever considers and I don't consider, but I'm sure that there are listeners out there that are saying, Doc, why are you wasting your breath with people like these? If they have demonstrated that they're killers, why are they not getting the death penalty? I refuse to get into that as a debate because that's not what this show is about. So if that really is your thought, then maybe this episode isn't the one for you in the first place. Because I still have to see that person as a human being. And I still have to think that there is something that can be done to make things better than they are. I apologize for not laying out a better groundwork. I usually have a much better framework for dealing with this. But even within the mental health community, we don't have consensus about what the proper treatment is because there's still a debate as to whether or not there's quote unquote treatment. That's just keeping it 100. (laughs) Sorry, sorry. But that doesn't mean we don't continue to try. That's fair. Nor do I think we should ever stop trying as idealistic and pie in the sky as that may be. I think just because, because it's the idealist in me and I am freely admitting that I am a, I'm a pragmatic idealist. I'll put it that way. I'm not so far idealistic that I think that anything and everything is possible. I'm certainly operating within the constraints of reality, but to the extent that we can push for, something, I don't see why we shouldn't try. We can't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And so in a case like Cletus or in the case of any serial killer, I think certainly we need to try. Having said that, I also acknowledge that I may not be, as you said earlier, I'm not the person who who's willing to try. I only have so much time and energy that I can expend on things like that. So I will walk away from people, but that's not to say that they should be completely abandoned by everyone. The best thing I can say for the sake of the health of the people around patients like this or clients like this is don't do this alone. I don't just mean that from like the security standpoint. I mean, and I think I mentioned this in the Joker episode, that more than one professional, both to potentially talk with the patient as well as to debrief each other on situations, and and more importantly, as a team at different levels, for example, nursing staff, social workers, etc. That's a great approach because no one part of the system gets burnt out. These patients take a lot of time and effort. And if you are not cognizant of it, they will drain you till you have nothing left. And unfortunately, as much as you may in the moment want to give everything of yourself, there are other patients, there are other people in your lives that you need to make sure have that same part of you, have that same effort. So that's another big part that I want to get out there. If you are a mental health professional and this is your population, kudos to you. I think you're doing an amazing job, even if no one else tells you that. And if that's the only thing you've ever gotten from a podcast like this, then that's fine. But also make sure you take time for yourself just to give that as a, you know, pep talk. Absolutely. I always say you can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to make sure you keep some stuff in for yourself. So with all that being said, let's see what happens when we get Cletus Cassidy on Dr. Issues' couch. Hello, Mr. Cassidy. I'm Dr. Issues. Hello, doctor. Are you comfortable? 
You know, these restraints can be pretty chafing. Uh, mind loosening them up for me? You know I can't do that. Oh, but isn't that what you shrinks are all about? Making people free from the shackles of their own mind? Pretty hypocritical of you to try and get me to open up if you won't even talk to me without keeping me chained up like an animal. Those restraints are for my safety and yours. Over time, if you show some actual rehabilitation, we can discuss that option. For now, you'll stay restrained. Oh, you don't have to worry about my safety. I don't believe I'd be harmed. You and these guards, on the other hand... And that's exactly why you're in the chains. Oh, come on now. You can't take a joke? I thought you were supposed to be a funny guy. I can take a joke, just as long as there's no evidence to support someone being homicidal. Your history definitely proves otherwise. Yeah, it's my history. Let's talk about that. Many people have the stereotype that violence and murder are somehow enjoyable for the person. I don't automatically subscribe to that. In fact, most of the people I see consider it to be painful to have that much loss of control. Interesting that you bring up control, because I was not in control for so long. I was living under the hypnosis of the symbiote, and now that it's gone, I'm coming to terms with what I've done. I'm amazed that you think I only read press releases. Your chart starts at a really young age. We can almost call this pre-symbiote and post-symbiote if you want, with respect to the amount of pain you caused. Oh, but even pre-symbiote, I was resurrected by an evil being who wanted me to free him. I mean, he was in my mind convincing me to do all of these evil things. And what led you to be his target? Here's a hint. I have some knowledge of that as well. He corrupted me right after I was born. Tabula rasa, Doc. I was born into this world with no preconceived notions of good and evil. I simply was. Everything I did since then was because he wanted me to be evil. And what scars did you earn when you clearly battled this evil and you weren't going to go along with this plan? Somehow I think the answer is that the battle didn't happen. Look, I have no problem with Tabula Raza, but you never even came close to trying to keep the slate clean. What, you think I didn't try? I was mentally and spiritually beaten down from the beginning. I was convinced that freedom through chaos was the only way. I was a brainwashed disciple of a horrific transdimensional being. How could I fight back against something that convinced me I was freeing people by killing them? Well, I think your victims disagreed. I think your grandmother disagreed. I think the guards in Juvie disagreed. I think many of your peers disagreed. I think during your trials, the judge and the prosecutor disagreed. How many other areas do you need people to disagree with you before you at least question that your path might need a little bit of an adjustment? I know, but to me, that just meant that I was doing something right. You know that old adage that if you're making everyone around you upset, you're on the right path. So you completely ignore the world around you, and yet don't actually consider anything beyond an initial event that happened when you were born? Look, I'm not saying this to be too critical, but honestly, who does that? I recognize that. That's why I'm here, and that's why I'm willing to talk to you. I want to prove that the influence is gone, and although I can't change what I did under Null's influence, I can prove that I'm not that person anymore, and I want to start making amends. Prove it to who? To me? You just met me. To anyone who will listen. If there's even just one person out there who I can prove I've turned a new leaf over to, then that's enough for me. Okay, I'll, I'll bite. What are your goals? I want to speak to people from in here to start and explain to them that there's a better way, that people who come from horrible beginnings like me don't have to go the same path. I've made mistakes, sure, but it doesn't have to end up like this. Uh, you have no idea how many times I've heard that. I'm willing to give you an opportunity to explain a unique spin because otherwise this is the same memorized trope that I've had to deal with for a decade. That's fair. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised to receive some pushback. How about this? I'll write down a list of things I want to talk about, and we can go over some of the finer details as I ruminate further on them. Well, that's fine, but you must think I'm a moron to give you a regular pen. Of course, of course. I'll work with whatever writing implement you give to me. Safety pen, highlighter, crayon, felt-tip marker. I know I can't be trusted with sharp objects. Okay, then. Uh, hmm. Here's a safety pen... Um, yeah, okay. In my line of work, we always have some extra paper, uh... Alright, here you go. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. Oh, shame. This ink is blue. I, I know what you're getting at. Look, look, if you're having any thoughts of harming yourself with that pen, it won't work, okay? It's a safety pen. Oh, I know that. But it wasn't the writing implement I was concerned with. I can still give myself a paper cut. That's not very hard. Oh, no. I told you I don't like blue ink. I prefer writing in red. 
You okay there, Doc? Uh, I could be better. Yeah, you could be alive. <sighs> Seriously, a paper cut? Of all things, a paper cut. I've seen people nearly eviscerate themselves, and I die because of a paper cut. No, you die because he gave himself a paper cut, which allowed the symbiote to leave his body and take over him. I died because I failed to prevent a paper cut. Yeah. Shouldn't have given him the paper. You know, I actually have a saying, scratch a cynic and you realize they're a wounded idealist. This took that to a whole nother level. <laughs> it certainly did. It absolutely did. So that's going to do it for this episode. Coming up, we are covering Ultimate Reed Richards, a.k.a. The Maker, who recently made an appearance not only in Absolute Carnage, but also in the Future Foundation, which is being written by a friend of the show, Jeremy Whitley. And then we're going to tackle Survivor's Guilt, as suggested by our present level patron, Matt. I want to mention that uh, I had said in the last episode that we were going to be doing a live appearance at Rogue Comics in September. Unfortunately, Doc and I couldn't get the schedules to, to work out. Something came up. So we're shooting for October right now. We will post more details about that as we approach the, the potential date, because now I don't want to say anything with specificity, because if something comes up, unfortunately, then we're going to be screwed. But, um, but in any case, where you can find us now, where I can say this with sincerity because we're doing it now, is we have a Discord channel. That's right. If you go to tinyurl.com slash capes discord, capital C and capital D, you will get an invite to join our Discord group, our Discord uh, server, which has a couple of different channels on it where we've got some information up already and we're hoping to further engage the community. I know a lot of folks like Discord. I've been involved on a couple of channels for different podcasts and a couple of different uh, other pod, um different other games and sort of things myself. And it's it's a fun messaging app, so you can check that out if you have any other questions about it. We'll be posting links on all of our social media pages as well. And we'll also be doing our live streaming through Discord so you can listen in as Doc and I record all of our future episodes. Um, one last thing, this coming Friday night, I know this is very short, so if you're listening to this like Wednesday morning or maybe even Thursday morning and you happen to be, in North or Central New Jersey on Friday night, Friday, September 13th, I will be hosting a charity night at George and Martha's in Morristown for Extra Life. And you can find out more about that. I'll post all the links on our social media pages, but basically a percentage of the proceeds from food sales will be going towards Extra Life. And if I raise $1,000 by the end of the night, I will be singing Taylor Swift. And I would sooner chop off a limb than sing Taylor Swift. That's okay. You can just shake it off. I will say I am very happy that the new Tool album is supposed to, at least as we're recording this, the new Tool album, which is amazing, is supposed to take the number one spot on the uh, Billboard chart, and it is upsetting all of the Taylor Swift fans as well as the Lana Del Rey fans. Okay, because they didn't sell a lot of albums. I, I never understood. Look, I'll just be blunt. I've never understood this. It's like saying someone's successful so I'm upset that other people are successful. Do you realize how ridiculous that sounds? Well, first off, it's not that they're upset that someone else is successful. It's they're upset that Taylor, that Taylor Swift doesn't have the number one slot and that it's being overtaken by what, what the Taylor Swift fans are considering old men and old white men because apparently old white men like myself are the only ones who are listening to Tool. We've waited 13 years for this album. It's friggin' amazing. That's all I'm gonna say. So check out Fear Inoculum, especially if you hate Taylor Swift. Just buy it and listen to it, just despite the Swifties. And and I'm going to say, just enjoy music that you like and support it. For the love of God, people, I don't understand why this is a thing. And I and this is not specific to Taylor Swift or Tool or anything that Anthony's talking about. I noticed this in society as a whole, and I've always thought it was stupid. So this really is my personality. I apologize if I'm the weirdo on this. I know I am, but still. Enjoy your music. Let other people enjoy theirs. Sometimes there's collaborations that happen that people love that they thought they never would. So just have fun. For the love of God, why? Why is this a thing? No, but don't you understand? As a Marvel fanboy, I must hate DC. Or as an Xbox fanboy, I must hate Sony. Or as a Coke drinker, I must hate Pepsi. None of those necessarily all apply to me because I don't drink soda. But in any case, <laughs> uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is... 
We are doing a listener survey because Doc and I want to find out more about you, more about what you like about this show, what areas of the show you feel need some improvement, what areas you really like. So if you go to our social media pages and if you go to our website, the link will be up and you can take it. It's a short two to three minute survey. Just answer a bunch of questions. Please be honest when you answer them because that's going to help make the show better. That's ultimately what it comes down to because we want to make the show better for you, the listeners. We want to find out what it is that you want from us and we, you know, we will find a way to work. We're not going to just sell out and give you whatever it is that you want because then we're going to potentially upset of all of our existing fans. But if there's an area where you say, this is great, I really like this, but if they just did this, I think it would be a little better. We will take that constructive feedback as long as it's not just, you guys suck. <laughs> and if you think we suck, then at least explain why you think we suck. Don't just say you guys suck and you don't know what you're talking about. Be be frank and be constructive with it. So please be honest. We're going to keep this open for about a month and then we're going to take the, the feedback and we'll sit down and we'll digest it all and we will, we will figure out uh, how everything is all going to come together. Um, so as always, you can find all of our episodes on our website, capesonthecouch.live or wherever it is that you download podcasts. We are available on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Capes on the Couch. You can email us at capesonthecouch at gmail.com for questions, comments, feedback, what have you. You can go to our Patreon site, patreon.com slash Capes on the Couch, and subscribe. Uh, our patrons now have extra Discord access. There's a Patreon-exclusive channel on our Discord. So if you go to Discord and if you sign up uh, on our Patreon, all patrons receive access to this exclusive channel, not not just even the levels. Literally, just a dollar will get you access to this channel. We have a T Public page, tpublic.com slash user slash capes on the couch. You can buy all sorts of cool merchandise, swag, t-shirts, mugs, etc., with our logo on it to show and support the show because that's uh, what keeps our lights on and that's what keeps us going. And I think I've hit everything I wanted to talk about. Doc, anything you want to mention before we go? Just don't be serial killers. It's as good advice as any. So for Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.